please welcome Richard. <laughs> Can you hear me? Hello? How did I get into this field? Heck if, heck if I recall. Um, I, I was a, a hardcore techie to begin with. I had a, got a bachelor's degree and also a master's degree in computer science. But, um, but then I, I also was, I, I, I was focused on computer-based instruction and, uh, and, and teaching. And, and indeed, with my bachelor's degree, I, got a, uh, I was certified to teach high school mathematics among other things, which was interesting. I never did so, but it, 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 it uh, uh, makes a reference to, indeed, my focus on education and teaching. And uh, my senior year, uh, what, as an undergrad, I had access to a Plato terminal. Have you heard of Plato, the Plato computer-based instruction system? Handful of you. Uh, and I started uh, uh, programming uh, educational materials, mathematics materials on Plato. And that sort of got me focused on the user experience, on user interface design. And so I guess that's 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 the pretty truthful answer to to your question. And thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, um, here we go, here we go. I'm waiting for things to pop up. Here we go, here we go. All right. In with the old, in with the new. Huh? It sounds, something's it's kind of odd. What's what's up? Um, let me see. What's what's wrong with that? Well, perhaps a good a good a good place to for jogging my memory is to look to Facebook. In September, I got a uh, Facebook memory reminding me that uh, seven years prior, I uh, I interviewed two people on stage in San Francisco at the Academy of Art University. Those two people, as you can see pictured down below with me, John Colco and Don Norman. And the title that I gave to that session was Out with the Old, In with the New. Ah, that's the way it's supposed to be, right? Well, maybe not. Um, shame on me for that title that could be interpreted as ageist. Well, it can be interpreted as ageist because it is ageist. It was ageist. Um, and ageism has a home here in Silicon Valley, big time, and elsewhere in tech. It's nasty. It's, it's pretty terrible. Where are all the older people at work? Oh, yeah, they've been fired. Such as at IBM. Familiar with this? Does this look familiar? You read about this? How IBM apparently flouted rules against age bias, laying off lots and lots of, of older people in the name of progress? Well, they've been sued for that. They were the, the lawsuit was fired in September. But it's not just old IBM where this has been a problem. It's elsewhere. Uh, including much younger Google. But U.S. labor law, as it says on the screen, forbids employment discrimination against anyone at least 40 years of age in the United States. However, as you can see in the lower part of the screen, that law has been dramatically weakened over time. So it's unlikely that those lawsuits will be won. Indeed, Baby boomers are taking on ageism via lawsuits, but they are losing. You read that sentence there? Prejudice against older workers remains among the most acceptable and pervasive isms, and it's not okay. But it's not just firing older people getting fired, it's older people having a hard time getting hired. And technology is used 
uh, in support of, of that mission. As you can see, did you did how many did you read about this? Do you, are you were you aware of this? How lots of companies using Facebook to exclude older workers from job ads, including Facebook. Is that much of a surprise, given what Mark Zuckerberg said? As you can see there, tech workers are, are not literally working themselves to death. That's a little bit exaggerated, hopefully. But almost killing themselves in order to keep their job. So they do their job, and they do so much more so that they will be retained. And it's tougher for older women. Older women have a harder time, but both men and women, as you can see in the headline at the bottom, in tech struggle to land work after age 40. All of this while the, the, the research reveals that age-diverse teams are much more productive, are much more resilient to turnover, and can approach significantly complex uh, problems as a group uh, much better than the non-age diverse teams. And as you can see in this tweet from Ashton Applewhite, the notion that older workers take jobs away from, or, uh, from, from younger ones, that's a, uh, a misprint there, a typo, has been debunked countless times. Also being debunked are the negative stereotypes of the differences between younger people and older people. Older Americans are more millennial than millennials. Digital natives know better at technology than the rest of us. So what the fuck is going on? I like the title of, of, of this article from earlier this year. I'm not 54, I'm 22, with 32 years experience. I like the title, I also like the fact, you see at the bottom, over 100,000 likes and 6,000 plus comments. So people are starting to pay attention, but it's still entrenched, and it's not okay. Another tweet from Ashton Applewhite. As you can see, this is an article. She, she references an article on uh, the U.S. isn't just getting older, it's getting more segregated by age. And as you can she, see, she says that it's sustained by lack of contact between old and young. So, for the next couple of minutes, find someone in the audience who, is, who looks younger than you or older than you and introduce yourself. Okay?
Hey, Joe. You should ask how many people were uh, here, who, who, how many people were alive when the first Beikai happened. I, I'll, I'll bring that up. I'll remember to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't put it that way, though. <laughs> oh, well, maybe I will. Yeah, yeah. Okay, can you hear me still? Hello? Hello, hello? Turn, turn on my mic if I'm off. Hello, oh, there we go, I think, I think. Hello? Hello, hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Oh, good. I think I could have just left. <laughs> yeah, you can just keep on talking for the rest of the evening. Well, thank you for doing that. Um, I hate going places where it's all younger people. I hate going places where it's all older people. I love going places where it's a mix of ages, and that's where I want to go and tend to go. Um, Ageism is, is horrific. It hurts people hugely. It's, it's, and it's just, it just it's getting worse because people are living longer and need to work longer. Um, it, it hurts older people. It hurts younger people. It hurts the economy. It's stupid. It's wrong. It needs to stop. So. No more out with the old, in with the new. Tonight's presentation, in with the old, in with the new. Does that make sense? Now here's the first paragraph of the abstract, which you may not have seen if you relied solely on the newsletter. So I'm not referring solely to ageism with this title. As you can see from the first sentence, I'm referring to the fact that, well, at least from Bill Buxton's perspective, and mine as well, um, practitioners these days don't seem to know that much or care to know that much about history. And that's not good. Here are some words from Bill Buxton that he uttered during a, a presentation earlier this year at Torquay, which is the Toronto chapter of Sikai. Make sense? P 
people need to know what has gone on in the past. Here he is uttering those words. Well, he may not have been uttering those exact words at this exact moment, but sometime during this presentation, he uttered those words. And as you can see at the bottom, unlike virtually any other creative discipline, our basic education does not include the cultivation of a deep literacy in our own history. And that's wrong. And that's hurtful. More words from Bill Buxton. So the, the full abstract hopefully makes, makes greater sense than only a portion of the abstract. Indeed, looking at the second paragraph there, um, I am going to look back at where we have been, mostly by revisiting some of what happened right here, mostly here at Park uh, on, this, uh, on the Beikai stage, during Beikai's early years, that is, during the years during which I was program chair, the, first, the 12 of the first 13 years. And then I will seamlessly segue into looking forward to where our HCI design is heading and needs to head. And we'll see how you react to that. Um, also, as you can see, I was known uh, as Mr. Bekai for most of those, those years. Uh, 90 to 93 or something like that. Some, some, or 93, 90 to 2003, or something like that. Um, I was known as Mr. Bekai in part because you might, because for, for the longest time I, I, I wouldn't bother to, this was, this was kind of weird, I wouldn't bother to introduce myself. So people didn't know my name for the longest time. And the reason that I, and, and people, I learned later that people kind of thought that I was being arrogant and pompous <laughs> by not doing that. I was just trying to, I wanted the focus to be on the speakers. But I got a nickname of Mr. Baker. Week ago, I attended a, a talk in San Francisco on uh, the blockchain ecosystem, and this is one of the slides. To know where you are, you must know where you've been. The challenge is finding the right narrative to follow. Let's take a journey. Shall we? We'll start with something that happened in 1968. Yes, that was before I was Bankai Program Chair. <laughs> but it was 50 years ago plus two days. It was 50 years ago Sunday. This was the amazing demo that became known as the mother of all demos by Doug Engelbart. And it knocked, it, it changed the world of computing forever. Here's a piece that was published in Wired on Sunday. 50 years later, we still don't grasp the mother of all demos and its impact. Here's a paragraph from that article. Wow. And as you can see from the last sentence, his work was never really about the technology itself, but about helping people work together to solve the world's biggest problems. And Doug Engelbart was here on this stage, twice. Second time I had the honor of interviewing him, and it was fabulous. You could hear a pin drop in this place. Is that right? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> good, 
question. <laughs> she's, she's resumed that role. Thank you so much, I think. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll get there. So, tomorrow evening, this will be discussed at a place not too far from here. This is in Mountain View, the Computer History Museum. You've all been to the Computer History Museum? Most of you, a lot of you. As you can see, the focus will be on can Engelbart's techniques for accelerating change solve the day's great problems? In with the old. This is tomorrow. So do you hear me? In with the old. Not out with the old, in with the old. Moderator will be Paul Sappho. Apparently there is an event at the Computer History Museum there Sunday evening too. It wasn't on the calendar. I didn't couldn't find it on the calendar. If 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 I had seen it, I probably would have considered going, although I had something else to do. But Paul Sappho was there, and here's what he, he said that uh, Sunday evening. Enough about these sprints that the tech community is so hung up on. They don't solve everything. In fact, they don't solve a whole lot. Paul Sappho, he was on this stage. He was on the Bay Kai stage. I interviewed him here on the Bay Kai stage with Jaron Lanier. You can see the title of the talk is of some relevance to this evening. Jaron Lanier, oh, I didn't, should mention Paul Sappho at the time, and for a long time was at the Institute for the Future. Jaron Lanier, have you heard of Jaron Lanier maybe? Only one, two, three people have heard of Jaron Lanier? Jaron Lanier was on the Bay High stage on two other occasions as well. This wasn't his entire, the entirety of his life's work, but his, his work, his, he, was, he was closely associated with, with virtual reality. And as you can see, that was the, po uh, the focus of his, his, his other presentations at Bay Kai. 1990 and 2003, in May, he was making the rounds. He, uh, among the places that he stopped, and gave talks at was Kepler's bookstore. You've been to Kepler's, been in the park. He's also uh, an accomplished musician. He makes instruments. He knows all sorts of things about rare instruments. He played one at Kepler's, and then he talked about the problems in our society today that have been inflicted by technology. And among the things which he recommended, as in suggested by this headline, from BBC News, and he talked about this at Kepler's, was that um, uh, to solve some of the problems of Facebook and Google, that they need ad-free options. Jaron Lanier, speaking here in 1990. Jaron Lanier, speaking nearby in 2018. In with the old. Make sense? Now here's something where I might say, out with the old. <laughs> Have you seen this, over, this kind of overhead projector before? If you were here when I was Bankai program chair, you've seen this overhead projector. It used to sit right there. Well, it may not have been this one exactly. But uh, this is where I, the, the reference to progressive disclosure Apparently, a lot of people would. You, this is. You, do you know? Do, does everybody know how these things work? You would take transparencies. Things were printed on transparencies on these, these clear acetate things. Where are they acetate? I don't know what the hell they are made of. Um, and then you put them on the surface there, and then they're displayed up on the screen. 
And that's, that's what we would use that for, for our, all presentations for, for years here, here at then Xerox Park. And, and I would, uh, apparently most people would just sort of put the entire thing out there so that everybody could see the entire thing. I would slowly disclose what was, what was on uh, the transparency to, you know, for tension, for, for suspense, for excitement. For fun, progressive disclosure, I became known, I think, almost as often as Mr. Progressive Disclosure as I was Mr. Bacon. Out with the old. Out with the old applies to this, I think. Although that would have been kind of fun. Oh. You're right. You're right. So I stand corrected. I actually asked if 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 I could if they still had one here, and if they had, I would have used it. <laughs> Not for the entire presentation. Though. This is how I looked back then. Now, Fred, when he saw me this evening, said I hadn't changed a bit. I still have the twinkle in my eye. Is that true? <laughs> I think my hair was probably still this long as recently as a week ago. I really got it cut off, but somehow it's changed shade. Here's, here's more about me. Um, Smitha Red uh, made a reference to most of this. I'll, I'll make a reference to OE Strategy, which is uh, the little consultancy of which I'm, I'm one of two principals. Um, Smith made a reference to my being editor-in-chief of Interactions Magazine with John Kokel for three years. Um, the work that I did helping chapters around the world get going and get started in various places where I taught and the fact that I'm now at the Austin No. It's an acronym which makes no sense, and it does make sense, so don't ask. <laughs> there it is again. Sorry. But that's, that's uh, uh, the first panel of, of, of our web page, but it gives you a sense of, of what we're about, focused on helping organizations seeking to make a positive difference in the world. Austin Center for Design, if you haven't heard of it, it was founded by John Coco and has that humanitarian focus. So you get a sense of what I'm focused on in my life these days. Here's a bunch of stuff, most of which um, is stuff that, that I've been up to of late. So these are titles of things I've written, references to places where I've, I've given talks or, or titles of talks references to projects. They, they focus on improving the design process. They focus on changing design. They focus on uh, transforming the healthcare system, which is badly broken. They focus on uh, increasing uh, diversity, duh, uh, in the workplace. You'll see a couple of references to things there along those lines. They focus on on teaching social entrepreneurship, which I do at the Austin Center for Design. They focus on, uh, on, on what to do to make companies step up and become more socially and environmentally responsible. So that gives you a sense of what I've been up to of late. But what was I up to on October 9th, 1990? I was here. At, at then, I'll, it, we call, it was called Xerox Park. And here was the program of the evening. I'll let you read that. So you got a sense of it? It's, it's a little perplexing, perhaps. Here, 
couple of images of the environment in which he which, which he envisioned that, that he wanted to have and to use for, for performing and composing music. That's him, that's Craig in that environment. You might call this an early, early vision of augmented reality. And this program knocked me out. It was the first program for which I was ever program chair. And you know what? Only about five people showed up. I thought that was it for me. I screwed up the first time. Uh, they wouldn't want me back as program chair. Well, that turned out to be wrong, thank goodness. But this was actually my first program. It was possibly, well, among, certainly among the best and so few people got a chance to experience it, which is uh, a shame. I made a reference to Bill Buxton earlier. I claim that he had been on the Big High stage twice during its early years. There are references to those programs. Second time, that's Bill on the left. Second time, he uh, was on stage with Stu Park. Stu Park. Stu Card who uh, worked here at, uh, at, at Xerox Park. On a couple of other occasions, I also interviewed Bill Buxton on stage, not, not here um, at, at, at Park during a Bay Chi program, but uh, in one case at, the, at a Chi conference, Chi 99. And, um, and the, the tra edited transcripts of of these, this interview and, and other interviews was pub were published in Interactions magazine. And this was, a, I love this particular interview, this conversation that I had with Bill Buxton and Cliff Nass. Um, and it was, but it was kind of odd because Bill was not there. We, we had a, we, Cliff was there and we had a chair for Bill, but we had a big photo of him Bill could not attend in person, so we, we heard his voice. He could hear us, so he, was, he participated in the conversation from afar. Does that make sense? And it was fabulous. The focus was on human limits to HCI. Um, all four of these people have been on the Big High stage. Bill Buxton is still doing his thing as I had shown you before. Jacob Nielsen, of course, as you probably all know, is still doing his thing in the field. Clement Mock is doing his thing, although uh, instead of designing, focusing on the design of technology, he's focusing on the design of award-winning sushi restaurants. Cliff Nass, unfortunately, we lost at a very young age. But in three cases, or maybe two-ish, in with the old. OK, audience participation. I'm going to go through, I'm going to show you photos of people, other people, who were on the Bay Chi stage when I was program chair that agreed to come and appear at the Bay Chi program. See if who you recognize. And then I want you to say, what, what, why would, who, why? Why would, I, what would they have been doing here? What, what, what kind of, what relevance were they to the field? Okay, okay? You ready? This is a quiz. You have to get 80% or you don't go get, get, get to leave. No, 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 that's okay. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Let's, we'll just, we'll just holler it out. It, well, it's up to you. So the first one, ready? Here we go. Who's this? Alan Kay. Alan Kay, and, and why, wh what was he known for? Dynabook, small talk, object-oriented programming, desktop metaphor, father of mobile computing. He was a big deal, he, he was here.
Yeah. Okay, enough about Alan Kay. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this? <laughs> well, I think a lot of five-year-olds think that. Here's, here's the next person. Who's this? Oh, two people. Jeff Raskin on the left. Who's on the right? Aza Raskin. Jeff Raskin was on the Big High stage several times. What, what, what was Jeff, what is Jeff known for? The Canon Tech. The Mac was his idea. Close-ish. <laughs> anyway, he was on the stage several times, and, and Aza, his son, actually was on the stage once with him. They actually performed a little play here. He was a kid at the time. This is, I couldn't find a young picture of, of Aza, but Aza has been quite uh, something in the field. He's continued some of the work of, of his father and he's also done uh, a lot of work. He, he worked at, uh, I think he was with Mozilla, doing a lot of work at Mozilla. He, I think he's now a part of a, of, of a health startup that's, that's doing some really great work. So, old and new here. Ted Nelson? Ted. Hypertext. Ted Nelson. He was here twice. Xanadu, Xanadu exactly. Is that right? <laughs> Ted Nelson, big, a big deal, he was here. Aaron Marcus, one of the times that Ted was on stage, he had a debate with Aaron Marcus. Aaron lost. But Aaron Marcus, what? What can you say about Aaron Marcus? What do you know about Aaron? Design. Graphic design. Brought the attention to graphic design to, to the world, to, to our world, big time. Who's this? Lucy? Lucy Suchman? Lucy Suchman, oh, not too many people know. Okay, some of you are in danger of not being able to leave the, the, the auditorium. Situated learning. She worked at Park for 20 plus years. Yeah, it really changed uh, the, the way of looking at, uh, at human-computer interaction in a major way. A huge impact on the field. And, how, and knowing what she changed and how she changed it, um, would, would be of great value to absolutely everyone. Right now, she's a professor at a university somewhere in England. Yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. She had a huge impact on the field. Oh, silence. Howard. Howard. Rheingold. The well. The well. Other things about Howard? He, yeah, he, he, he did, he got, she, he did a, Kind of stuff early, early on, and, and is still active. A big burning, a big Burning Man enthusiast, as I came to learn have, since I saw him out at, at Burning Man, and talked to him about the experience. Huge impact. He's still, he's still doing stuff. In with the old. No. Bill Mogridge. One of the co-founders of IDO. 
He also got, she also designed the first laptop computer, supposedly, or some, there's some contention of that, but I believe that he, he there, the, the argument is pretty strong. Huge influence on the field. He was here on stage. I interviewed him on stage. Wonderful guy. Unfortunately, he, he, he is no longer with us. Bruce Tognazzini. Who, 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 who is he? Yes, big, big influence at Apple in the early years. Starfire, he worked at Sun, worked on the Starfire project, which was very seemingly impactful, certainly at the time. I think he was, he was with WebMD for, for a while, I think that's correct. I think he, he might still have a relationship with the Nielsen Norman group. He still might be involved with them. In with the old. Joy Mountford. No, and I, I think mostly or particularly for her work at Apple. So very influential for a time at, at Apple Computer. Um, she's held executive design, executive positions in various other places over the years. As, as well. She was, I interviewed her, her on stage, but she was here on another occasion as well. Andy Hertzfeld. He was a part of the, 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 the initial Mac team. Pardon me? He then was at General Magic. What happened to General Magic? <laughs> Eventually, but it handheld device, sort of the precursor of the smartphone. He, I also, he eventually worked at Google, and I, I believe I read that he's largely responsible for Google Plus. Maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but, he, but he was here. Ah. Ah. Terry Winograd, greatly influential. Yeah. Computer professional, very good. Computer professionals for social responsibility. He was instrumental in, in that organization for a lot of years. Taught at Stanford for a lot of years. Um, he was here on stage. Uh. Ah. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. So he, he did he, he was extremely influential in the field. He was he was here at Big High. He, one, one of his advisees. Larry Page, hello. I think his company was in the news today. Does anybody pay attention to the news as much as I do? If you don't, good for you. Yeah, an executive of Google was under fire in Washington, D.C. today. Yeah. Guy Kawasaki. Van big time evangel marketing evangelist at, at Apple. I th yes. That, I don't know. I think I, I supposedly he did, but uh, guy did, but I, I don't know. He was here. He was here. Uh, yeah, probably several people. Who's this? 
Allison Druin. She's spent, uh, spent a lot of years at University of Maryland College Park, known particularly for her extensive work in designing for and with children. She was here, one of the early people doing working in this, this space. Oh, silence. John Carrot and Claire Marie Carrot, the, the, the Carrots, they were a married couple, very much involved in initiating and promoting in the early days usability engineering. How many have heard that term for a while? Karen Holtzblatt, contextual design. Hugh Dumberley, information design. When I say these two words, do they mean anything to you? Knowledge navigator. Big time influence, something that was created at Apple to show what is possible, what they believed would be possible in the future. And they got lots of calls they wanted, people wanted to buy it. Um, it was basically an intelligent agent. We'll talk about intelligent agents a little bit more in just a few minutes. Hugh Deberly, he's, he's still going strong. Deberly Design Office in San Francisco, doing a lot of great work. Uh, really known for his, his focus on, on modeling and the importance of modeling and design. Amy Jo Kim, early on, a big pioneer in the world of online communities. And then, and still, in game design. Hmm? Ben Schneiderman. Ah. Also, yeah, University of Maryland College Park. Big influence on the field early on in all sorts of, in all sorts of ways. He was here. Who is this? Oh my God, that was fast. Rick Smolin. Rick Smolin. And who, and who was Rick, who is, was? Yeah, Day in the Life books. Uh, he would send a gazillion photographers out on, in one particular 24 hour period. And then he published books with photographs that they took. And, and this was in various places around the world. Also, uh, 24 hours in cyberspace, cyberspace, and that was what he was here talking about. He also, a more recent project, focused on the human face of data. Very, very impactful for a lot of, of people. Oh my God, I, this is hard to believe. Brenda Laurel. So when I say her name, does that remind you of, of, of her and what she was up to? She did a number of things. She was instrumental in the early days of, of virtual reality and, and she was, I think, most particularly, no, she's no, she did a lot of incredible things. She started Purple Moon. Game to, games for girls. Somewhat controversial, but, but just, just trailblazing, just, just amazing the stuff that she did. She gave uh, the, the opening plenary talk earlier this year at the Interaction Design Education Summit in Lyon, France. She's still going at it. In with the old. Alan Cooper. Father Visual Basic. Cooper Design. He was here in August speaking at Beikai, but but back when I was program chair, I interviewed him on stage on humanizing technology. Oh! <laughs> we, I just saw the film. 
who is that? I, I couldn't remember who this guy was. He's right there. <laughs> Jeff Johnson, I think, Jeff, you hold the record for a number of times, number, the, the person who has spoken most at Beikai. Eight times, is that not, nine times? Yeah. I couldn't, couldn't see that very well. Yeah. And in fact, uh, just like late last year was most recently, so about a, a little, about a year ago or so. And he was on a panel at the very first ever Bay Kai program right here at Xerox Park. And Jeff, do you remember what you talked about? <laughs> yeah. It was the Xerox Star. The star it was a star retrospective. I was not program chair then, but I was in attendance. The Xerox Star was oh, my, my influential beyond belief. Well, I can't talk about it in my classes anymore. Nobody knows what it was. <laughs> well, that's, that's, my, that's my point. Don't you think they should? Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes but. Here, here I have three images, because these were, are all, at one time, big high chairs. Nancy Frischberg on the left, she, when I was program chair, she, she was on a couple of programs focused on sign language for the most part. Uh, Ellen Franzik in the middle, she spoke on, on groupware, her early focus was, was on groupware. Dave Rowley on the right, focused on usability testing, a, a, a pretty clever form of usability testing that, that he was involved in. They, they were all big high chairs. And they're all still doing it and still doing some, some great work. Ellen was focusing on ro robots rec until recently. I, I'm not, Dave is an a, a executive at some tech company. Um, all still doing their thing. In with the old. Oh, Don Norman. If you do not know who this guy is, out. <laughs> Don? Yeah, he, yeah, I was going to say he was, he, he's, he's ranked number two in a number of appearances at Beikai. Um, yeah, he, uh, um, this was the first time that we, we, I decided, you know, this place isn't big enough for, for Don Norman, the first time that he spoke here. So I said, let's move it to Stanford. And we moved it to a 600-seat auditorium in Stanford, and we filled the place. Don Norman, I'll make a reference to him more a little bit later on. Yeah, that's right. He's, he's right now, he's, he's back at UC San Diego. In with the old. Who is this? Who said that? Sarah Little Turnbull. I interviewed her on stage here. I interviewed her on stage on three occasions, I think. Here is a description of Sarah. The time I interviewed her here, she was 84 years old. She was a design pioneer. She was amazing. I interviewed her on stage another time at the closing plenary of the first Dux conference, Designing for User Experiences uh, conference, and she got a standing ovation. Wow. People said, wow a female role model that we didn't know about and that they, people had been looking for for years. And she was there. She was here. An incredible person. She became a good friend. I'll let you read a little bit of a blog post that I wrote.
Can you all see that in the back, by the way? Is that uh, good? Thank you. Everybody read that? Can I move on? Another, just a couple more seconds. Big, big proponent of field research. Here's here the next little bit from the blog post. Big influence on David Kelly of IDO fame. I said, many designers still don't know that that kind of research is important. She said, what do they think design is anyway? A great response. And we had several programs here while I was program chair on this kind of research from people including like 93, Jane Fulton Surrey, Lori Vertelny, Genevieve Bell, who was at Intel for a lot of years, is now uh, somewhere in Australia again. Victoria Bellotti, who was here at, Victor at uh, Xerox Park for years, Robert Riemann at Cooper. So we were, so, you know, I, I was on top of this. I, you know, I wanted people that, there are still companies who don't get it. There are still designers who don't get it. What the fuck? Bonnie Nardi got it. She was an anthropologist. Here's a description of her talk. very influential anthropologist doing this kind of research in order to influence the design of intelligent computer agents. I, I am Spoon Man. This is fabulous. I'm now going to go to the video. I am Spoon Man, believe it or not. Spoon Man, that's S P O N M A N. Spoon, as in most ancient tool known to man, as in first among utensils to dish up food, fun, or trouble. Oh, buddy, Spoon. Now you are in Spoon Man's corner. Good work. Now you are in Spoon Man's dream. Good luck. Yeah. Okay, how do I get back my uh, slide deck? Say again? Tab? Command tab. Thank you. Spoonman was here on the Bake High stage. What the hell for? He talked about intelligent agents. Very imaginative, very, very important presentation, very important perspective on the design of intelligent agents. Spoon Man. We had a little fun here at, at Bakai on occasion. But he was, he was, he was an impressive guy. Everybody read that or enough of it to get a sense of Spoon Man? Artificial intelligence. How? 2001. We had a screening here, an advanced screening of a, of a film that was to be aired on PBS. We, we had the first screening ever of 2001 Hell's Legacy. Artificial intelligence. Gone awry. This spring was the 50th anniversary 
of the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, and as you can see, it still fascinates. I, I saw it during this time period. It's fabulous. It's an incredible film. Still influential. In with the old. Right here at Park, Thursday evening, two evenings from now, there will be a talk. Kara Swisher is going to be here talking with the CEO of Park about ethics and artificial intelligence. In with the old. Make sense? I'll probably say that about five more times. Oh! The Cuckoo's Nest. A book by Clifford Stoll, an astronomer who investigated when the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, that was, that's not the exact quite name, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, I think is the name of it, was hacked. Hacking. Is that a topic that we hear about today? Duh. He wrote a book about his, his he found the hacker. He, he found the hacker in Germany. And guess who the hacker was selling his information to? The KGB. Russian hackers, do we hear about this? That book was published in 1989. Cliff Stoll was here a few years later on stage at Bay Chi with a skeptical view of computing. As you can see, the first sentence, I'm tired of reading gushing articles about the wonders of computing. And he goes on. And for good reason. We had other presentations during that time period of a similar nature, such as this one from, from Norman Nee, about how the internet was changing daily life. And not for the better. Do we hear things along these lines? Yeah, go ahead. Mm. Yeah. Then he, yeah, he, he learned that that the lab had been hacked. Yeah. So he became skeptical about about computing, in part for that reason, but other people were skeptical back then and here on the big high stage, and worried and concerned. And, as Edwin mentioned earlier, that included Brenda Laurel, one of the times she spoke here. Very concerned, very, very concerned in her talk in January of 2000. Soon technology will permeate our bodies as well as our environments. At the same time, the constraints of living in the natural world will become more acute, needs for energy and food will grow. Threats to the environmental systems will cascade, etc. Societies and individuals will be sorely challenged to maintain integrity at all levels. She was right. She, she talked about the need for tools for knowing, judging, and taking action in such times. We still need those tools. Because everything that she predicted came true. Here's my seamless. Uh, a segue. According to Ian Bogust, fabulous writer, designer at, at the, the, the Atlantic, people don't seek out computers in order to get things done anymore. They do things that let them use computers. Wow. That's huge. Wow. The suicide rate for kids it's climbing, it's off the charts. It's scary as hell. P 
people are quitting these companies because of their concern about smartphone dystopia. Zainab Tufekci, incredible researcher and, and commentator. Follow her on Twitter. Follow her on Twitter if you, if you, if you don't. They're building a dystopia, dystopia just to make people click on ads. Mark Hurst. Beauty of tech that we can build whatever we want. The tragedy is we build a casino under surveillance. Both Twitter and Facebook feel broken. I'm ready for a new pro platform that respects the user, has a founder with sound values and a strong moral compass. And concerns like this. Is this outrageous? Is that what autonomous vehicles are really all about? Hey, people concerned about smart cities. Smart city concept, you're familiar with it? One of the problems with smart city ideology or propaganda is that it's all for the smart, by the smart, for reasons of the smart. Uh oh. This was in the news today, Trump's wall. Did you hear about the argument in the White House about the, the, the border wall? Hello, do, do, come on. Do, am, yes. am, am I the only person who, who, who pays too much attention to the news? I thought everybody did. He and Nancy Pelosi got in, and uh, Chuck Schumer got in an argument about the, the wall in the White House. Apparently, it's something to see. I haven't watched it. But did, you, did, did anybody notice this? To, uh, spring of last year, a design firm wants to make Trump's wall big, beautiful, and sustainable. You did, nobody, well, hello, or did you not see this? Does nobody else watch the news? Here's Ethan's response. No. More from Ethan. Here's a quote from uh, the, the article. The two principals didn't want to talk politics and emphasize that their mission is purely architectural. Ethan's response, no. The great lie we tell ourselves, that design is somehow distinct from and different to and more pure than the world it sits in. It's a great, pervasive, ruinous lie. Every decision made by a designer is shaped by bias. Design is not neutral, it never has been and never will be. Design is political. Somewhat related to uh, a panel that I put together. This isn't, this wasn't June of this year, this was June of last year. I should modify that to reveal that on the topic of whether designers are becoming the new activists. I had this really diverse collection of, of panelists. And it was a contentious discussion, interestingly enough. Um, I've, I've, I've focused on this topic ever since in a, in a very big way. And that included actually giving a talk along these lines at the Interaction Design Education Summit in Lyon, France earlier this year. Is it ethical for designers to function as activists when they're practicing their profession? I, I published a, a, a conversation that I had with John Kolker, who I mentioned earlier, about the relationship between design and activism. These are some of John's words. Design shapes society in a quieter, gradual manner than one typically thinks of activism. It's silent, subtle, but we ignore it, and one day we realize society has changed, and we've changed with it. And man, oh man, has that ever been true. Here's this nice little short piece by 
This is Liz, Liz Hubert. Published two years ago. I, I see this every day. I don't know where you where you spend your time. I'm 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 on Bart quite a, quite a bit. I I see this on the sidewalks. You know, people aren't just standing still; they're walking. Liz real, uh, began to realize that oh my gosh, we all are part of the problem. Here's a little bit more from that piece. UX designer doing her job, applying human-centered design, and fucking up the world. <laughs> I think we're reading here of the birth of a designer as activist. People, when they define design, often say it's problem solving. Well, yes. But design creates problems too. Let me let me hold you. Design for delight. Design for delight. That's what design should be all about. Oops. The executive director, no longer the executive director, but until recently she was, of AIGA, um, promoted promoted this concept of of designers as activists, arguing that designers are perfectly well equipped and sh should be viewed as, as activists. They've got all the tools and really should be activists. Design for America on multiple college campuses around the United States. Designers' role is the role of good citizenship, fighting against tyranny, listening to and raising marginalized voices, bringing design for change. Kind of sounds like activism. Anne Marquez, 2015, wrote, designers are the new activists, no question about it. The ultimate activism. Jen Polka preaching user-centered design. Code for America, the amazing work that they're doing there. U.S. Digital Service, believe it or not, is in the White House. Find the truth, tell the truth. Wow. Not necessarily a typical behavior in the White House, but yes, the U.S. US Digital Service is doing fabulous work in this White House. Future of humanity depends on design ethics, according to Tim Wu. I'll let you read that. Pretty good explanation of the problem here, I think. Future of humanity depends on design ethics. Wow. Mike Montero in San Francisco, big proponent of design ethics. Ethics can't be a side hustle. Have designers lost control of design? Designers now have a lot of power, in theory. They have a seat at the table now. What's gone wrong? Oh, they too become beholden to business interests. Oops.
Does that make sense? One more paragraph from this piece. What does this mean for designers? What ethics should designers adopt? What is their responsibility? Can they keep their position of power while maintaining their agency? Important questions. Got a sense of that? Well, right here at Bake High, in the 90s, we address these kinds of things. Don Norman, one of his talks, when, where HCI design fails, the hard problems are social and political, not technical. Organizational obstacles to good design, something we address multiple times. Here are three such examples. One of the times that I interviewed Don on stage was at a Kai conference, and we talked more about it there. It's a big deal, organizational obstacles. Yes, I bet some of you have experienced a few organizational obstacles in your, in your lifetime. Ooh. What do you think about this? Design has never been ethical. Design is inherently an unethical industry, is the claim. Well, some, some might, might argue that. Well, that I, I like that perspective. So along those lines, whether we choose to recognize it or not, designers have both the authority and responsibility to prevent our products from becoming needlessly invasive, addictive, dishonest, and harmful. To continue to pretend this is someone else's job, we can, but it's not. It's our job. Designers, according to Mark Reddig, don't fight for people strongly enough. They allow business and technology concerns to trump human concerns. Alan Cooper, that picture of him on the screen a little bit ago, he was here in August, as I mentioned earlier, and he talked about this. Whenever you say that's not my problem, you create an externality, and every externality becomes a hole in your boat. It's your responsibility. We attribute vastly too much power to a handful of product managers in Menlo Park. You, can't, you have to stop saying, I don't get to make the decision. Designers are well positioned to lead this evolution. I'll let you read that paragraph. Time for designers to step up. You got that? Can I go on? I sometimes go too fast, I realize. I'm going to go on. In this conversation I had with John Colco, he quoted someone from two decades ago, Catherine McCoy. We must stop inadvert inadvertently training our students to ignore their convictions and be passive economic servants. Instead, we must help them to clarify their personal values and to give them the tools to recognize what is appropriate to act on them. Well, some of my personal values that have influenced what I do and what I act on were influenced from my own experiences. I had a health and health care nightmare back in 2009, and it almost did me in completely. And it was, it was unnecessary. I was misdiagnosed. It was horrific. It was, and I've written extensively about it. And after I escaped the healthcare system, as I put it, 
I learned that this, this is a common story. I committed a part of my career to changing the healthcare system. This has motivated a lot of my work. Here are just references to examples, things I've, I've places I've spoken, things I've, I've written, work I've done. This put me on the street. I was homeless. I lived in my car. That was, that's, that was my home, actually. My car there, that's my car. For a year. I've written about all of this stuff. I know what it's like to be treated like scum, like so many people treat homeless people. I know what it's like to, to struggle getting services from, from a government where this, it's, just, it's just horrific what, what people are required to do. Home, homeless people are some of, some of the most amazing people. I mean, people who look down upon the homeless could not handle being homeless. They don't know what it takes. That motivated me, so I've done some of my work focusing on the homeless. And I refer to some of that in, in some of the things that I've written, such as those things on the screen. I've already talked about ageism. I've experienced ageism. You can see I, it pisses me off. It's not okay. It's not just okay that, it, uh, that I've experienced it. It's, it's not okay that anybody experiences it. I wrote a piece about it two years ago called My Best Work Lies Ahead of Me. And then this, this summer, I attended a panel of, of diversity in tech in San Francisco. The panelists were, were people who are responsible for increasing diversity in their, in their tech companies. And they were saying, yeah, we realize we've screwed up with, 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 with gender diversity, we, it's, it's, uh, with, uh, with, with issues around ethnic diversity. We, we've screwed, it's, it's systemic. We, we've messed up. We need to change what we do. They didn't say anything about ageism and, and, and age diversity and, until somebody raised their hand, who might that have been, saying, hey, you didn't say anything about ageism. It's rampant in tech. Why is that? Look at my response. Well, the problem is that older people get angry. They need to stop being angry and figure out how to get a job. Holy fuck. This is not OK. This is what sent me over. I had written something two years prior, but I decided I needed to do more. This fueled my passion. I spoke on ageism at the Design and Diversity Conference in August in St. Louis. I gave a workshop of sorts at AIGA in San Francisco in September, and I was just back in Austin in November giving a talk on the topic as well. Something else that has, I've gotten into of late is, is along these lines. I'll let you read, get a sense of these tweets. Tweet by Jared Spool, who, by the way, has been, was here when I, on the Bay stage when I was program chair. But you can see his argument, these are the five things which, which execs of corporations are required to care about. These are what they're supposed to care about. Mark Reddy said, this sucks. It sucks. It's a great cartoon. It's a terrible cartoon, <laughs> which makes it a great cartoon. So I had a written conversation with Mark Reddick about this on what it takes for companies to move towards social and environmental responsibility, how we might help, and what that means for design. Read it. 
It's a long conversation. Medium ex estimates that it will take you 24 minutes. People don't read long things anymore. That's terrible. That's a part of the problem. These kinds of issues of responsibility can no longer be seen as a bolt-on. Lots of corporations do, do CSR projects. So they're just adjunct projects to make the company look good and to make their employees feel better. The argument is that, no, this has to be an integral part of how business is done. Michael Porter and Mark Kramer argued this in Harvard Business Review in 2001. I'll let you read that. inadequate to do CSR projects. It's inadequate to just do philanthropy. There's a need to create shared value where you create economic value while creating social value and or environmental value at the same time. There's great opportunity there. Oh, CSR computer, corporate, yeah, I, I got started with the wrong C, corporate social responsibility, thank you. So, uh, indeed, I've, I've, I've focused on this. It's hard to figure this out, but designers have the tools to help companies figure this out. So this is something that I'm working on these days. Problem, part of the problem is this persistence of outdated concepts of design and the role of designers in business. Designers don't get opportunities to work on this stuff. They should be working on this stuff. This is, this is critical. Our world is dying, for God's sakes. But it's time to change design. Move from human-centered design to humanity-centered design. There are a number of different frameworks that are being advocated and, and used that people argue are superior to what is typically, how human-centered design is typically done. One of them, another of them is equity-centered community design from the Creative Reaction Lab. Afrofuturism is quite amazing. Look it up. Circular systems design gets a lot of attention. IDO has a bunch of stuff on this, but uh, other people do as well, including Layla, who gave the closing plenary at the Interaction Conference in, uh, in Lyon in February. Regenerative design. People say, it's too late just to focus on sustainability. It's too late. We have to, we have to regenerate. We have to go further. There's a regenerative design framework. Transition design. People are paying lots of attention to transition design coming out of Carnegie Mellon. Design is activism. Ooh. I like all of those that I mentioned, but I think all of them can be subsumed by approaching design as activism. I'm not the first person to argue this. Others have as well but now it's critical. Agency grows the more you exercise it. To responsibly design for humanity, we must first know ourselves. Design is, after all, a fundamentally philosophical profession. What do you value? Thank you. That is the mic dropping. If you have questions, please raise your hand. So, Richard. Uh oh. 
seems like you would be the person to um, really um, codify the history, um, write the book or the equivalent. Ah. <laughs> um, have you thought about it? Well, you know, for the uh, a lot of uh, I, I did a lot of interviews, and certainly for those interviews, people said, you know, I should have the, all those things should have been recorded. You should have taken those and made put those into a book. It would have been a great book. Um, but but uh, record, recordings that were made actually some recordings were made of those sessions for the longest time without our knowledge, but by people here at Xerox Park. But they said, I'm sorry, it's for, you know, we can't share these recordings with you. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's one book. Um, I have a, a couple of other books I, I, um, I'd like to write, such as my horrific experience with the healthcare system, which I pretty much have written a book about already in blog form. I want to write a book on design as activism. I have got, I've got, I've got a lot of books to write. Some people write lots of books. This guy writes lots of books, so apparently I can do it. What's the difference between design ethics? What's the difference between design ethics and designing for social responsibility? Is there a difference? I don't, in my mind, I don't necessarily see one. Do you have a difference? Do you think there's a difference? <laughs> The reason I ask is that ACM has just formed a task force on social responsibility because they've decided, or at least some people in, in the hierarchy of ACM have decided that since CPSR went away, Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility, um, that they, ACM should take on that task now. Interesting. And so they formed a task force, and I'm on it, and some other people are on it. Wonderful. Um, and one of the first things that's being discussed is how is our charter different from the people at ACM who work on the ACM Code of Ethics? Do you have a sense of what the answer is? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're, like, you're, you're trying to cheat. <laughs> um, why did CPSR stop? Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility, why did that so, cease? That was like um, 2008? So he asked me that question because I used to be chair of CPSR for yeah. a while. Um, there are many reasons that CPSR ended in the, about 2011. Um, oh. One was that one of its organizations that spun out of it grew sort of bigger and more economically viable and kind of gobbled it up. Mm. That's the Public Sphere Project run by Doug Schuler up in uh, Washington and mm. Seattle. But another reason is that many of the issues that CPSR originated became mainstreamed. So, for example, we created the, uh, the um, Computers Free Freedom and Privacy Conferences, which were going on for a while, and that essentially moved away from CPSR and was taken up by ACM. And then we created the Participatory Design Conference which was taken over by ACM um, and several other organizations, the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, and um, Verified Voting and other yeah. organizations kind of spun out. Yeah, and gotcha. Yeah. So CPSR itself then sort of dissipated. But it sounds like, it, well, something along these lines are, is, is needed again. There's another question? Yeah. Um, it seems that designers are hired hands for business, and, and that that's pretty much what you're railing against, and I think what all of us kind of are also feeling, maybe, let's say. <clears throat> but the kind of social engineering that you're yearning for requires sustained and earnest and serious design efforts over time at least as intense as profit-driven organizations would push a designer. <laughs> and probably most designers are not independently wealthy. And so the question is how to 
fund or support, say, a cadre of world-class designers that would actually do some good. Uh, you, you, and the business, a, a codicil or a, a side part of this is, I don't think businesses will ever do anything but use designers as a hired hand because they have associations and lobbyists that go to the political class that keep their expenses externalized, that keep those kinds of things that a designer may cogitate, may actually impact out of the arena of making the money that supports the organization. So uh, this is a really complicated question, I guess, but how, I, I think it's the nub of the thing, right? Well, how would they, well, that's how would there be s support for such effort? That, that's why I think there's a need for uh, a reframing of design and what, a, and what a designer does and is and the value that they, that they can provide to a company and for companies to realize that by being socially responsible and being environmentally responsible is good for their bottom line. And, and, and you, you pull all that together and, um, and, and you, I think you will start getting change. And this is, this is the stuff that I'm, I'm working on now. So I, don't, I don't think it's, it's a matter, I mean, we, we have designers galore working for free or almost for free. Yeah. Uh, uh, working on this stuff enough, and, and that's, that, that's, that's, that's not sustainable. Right. It, would any of the big foundations, Ford found Rockefeller, I don't know. Oh, there are, you know, there are efforts, you know, there, you know, people fund some of the stuff. But trying to do, do it from a profit-making company seems like nibbling at the edges, trying to talk to somebody during coffee breaks or something. It just doesn't seem to have the power Com necessary. You know, corporations are looking for competitive advantage. And they are, and some are finding that they are well, well, and and people are saying enough of this crap. You know, companies step up. You're you're not okay, so they're under pressure. So so you know they're they're starting to pay attention to this stuff and trying to figure it out. And some companies have, but it's hard. It's 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 perplexing, and that's where designers can help. But designers aren't perceived as the kind of people who would be involved in this kind of stuff. They need to be understood as those kind of people who need to be participating in, in critical ways in this kind of work. And that's what I'm trying to, to work on. Yeah. One Thanks. of too many things, probably. Yeah? I think one of the observations I have is that a lot of corporations want to design products that are addictive. I mean, you see this in the pharmaceutical industry with opioids, <laughs> yeah. and, and it's kind of a mutual addiction because the customers are addicted, but then the corporation is addicted to that product line. And, and yeah. uh, you see this uh, obviously in our industry with you know, um, companies like Facebook and Google and Apple are trying to keep you yeah. Uh, with one YouTube video after another or something else that some other shiny object that grabs your attention because they could show you two more ads, right? And you'll spend more money and that's they'll right. be... That's right. And, and, yeah. and then there are the game companies. <laughs> yeah. I, I, have a, I have a relative who worked at Machine Zone uh, here in Palo Alto. And, um, you know, they have this game called uh, Game of War. Uh, which is amazingly addictive. People spend a lot of money on this game. And in fact, they had a woman who showed up at the headquarters with a gun uh, because she had spent $60,000 on this game and she wanted her money back <laughs> and they had to call the cops to kind of yeah. escort her out of there and all of that. But I mean, it just goes to show. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, I don't know that there's a great solution to this because it's kind of almost in the situation where if your company says we're not going to uh, do this because it's just flat out unethical, well then the company next door to you will do it and they will get greater shareholder value and eventually buy you out or whatever, right? So, I mean, I in a sense we're uh, pawns in the economic uh, chess game and how do you get out of that? It's a very hard problem. Yeah, and some people say that things like that to me and say, you know, the, the, the problem is with capitalism. Well, there are, you know, there's a re reference from 
uh, Porter and, and Kramer there to a different way of looking at capitalism. There's a movement called conscious capitalism. It, um, the, you know, a, a, a company with shareholders, a public company, in theory is responsible solely for, you know, financial, but it's, 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 it's a company for the public, to benefit the public. It isn't just money. Th th things have to be rethought, reframed, and my argument is that design needs to be reframed, and designers need to help with the reframing of, of, of that work as well. It's, it's, it's not gonna, it's, it's gonna take more than a, a weekend workshop to figure this out. But it it's gonna take a lot of such workshops and a lot more work. And some people are doing that work and I'm trying to play a small role. Richard, thank you very oh, much for your, uh, for your talk and your perspective. Um, I wonder if you'd care to uh, comment on the relation between agile and ageism and what design can do about it. Agile, the relationship between agile and ageism? Yeah, you touched on uh, IBM and controversy around IBM. Oh. There, have, there have been some recent uh, uh, media items about uh, basically framing what IBM did there with agile as a way of getting rid of its older workers and that, that was all part of that um, push to get rid of the older workforce. Older, you know, older people are perceived, you know, it's, it's the stereotype of older people lose interest, they don't want, they can't learn, they, they can't change. It's bullshit. I asked this as an agile fan. <laughs> well, you know, the, I'm not saying agile is, is necessarily bad at all. It's, 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 it's that older people can be agile as, as readily as younger people. The perception that that's not possible is ridiculous. Help, oh, or whoever has a mic, yeah. Um, on, on the subject of the sort of uh, the failure of capitalism to kind of deliver things th that allow design to do good things, uh, P Peter Drucker had a lot to say about this, saying that it's in the uh, interest and it's the, the obligation of the corporation or the responsible corporation to, to intervene on regulation and legislation to make sure that the price of p playing the game is that you have to play it fair. Do you feel like that's a way in, in terms of regulatory design? I know IDEO talks about designing systems, but in terms of the regulatory and sort of legislative impact, is that something that you see happening? Sure, it, it, um, I, I think, you know, I think people, companies, people need, people need to be motivated, not by law, but by, something uh, pur by purpose, by something they don't need. If they're doing things because they're forced to do it, they're gonna look for ways to get around it. And people get around regulations right and left all the time. I mean, I'm not saying no, don't, no, forget about it. I'm saying more needs to be done. Yes. Yeah. Richard, you've been in the education front quite some years and currently in Austin. Do you think today's designers are educated properly? That's the first question. And if not, what do you think should be in place and why? I, I th well, the reason that I was, that I spoke at the Interaction Design Education Summit was because I think that Interaction Design Education needs to change. I think that Interaction Design needs to change. So I think, I think there's a lot of good education happening, and some of it in places that, that is, are often criticized. Um, um, but, but more needs to be done. Um, m uh, things need to be taught that aren't taught. People, people need to, to for example, uh, un have tools and understand how to look into the future and see what might possibly go wrong. And have that uh, have an impact on their, on their design. For example, so, so I mean there, there's, a, there's a lot in, 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 in the talk I gave in Lyon and some other talks that I've given on, on this topic. I, 
there, there are more things that I talk about that need, that need to change. How design education needs to change and how design needs to change and how designers need to change. But there, there's, yeah, the, um, so I mean, a, a lot of stuff that is taught in, in typical design programs is, is terrific. But uh, there's, but it's, it's so impacted by the expectation that people are going to work for businesses where they're just going to be told what to do and they will say, yes, we'll do what you tell us to do. And so it's, it's speed, 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 fast, 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 don't think. That's, that's, that's not the kind of designer I want. That's not the kind of designers we, we, we put out into the world at the Austin Center for Design. Little plug there for the Austin Center for Design. Thank you, Richard, for the presentation back here. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, very good. Thank you. Yeah, and um, the insight that you bring, having been in the field for all these years, and then looking to the future, what we need to do as people age, and how to um, build products that help society. And I was in high tech for about three decades, and now I'm in the mental health field. And so I think, what can we do? to help educate young people as they're going through school. Like, do you know that, the, teaching them, do you know that these programs are designed to suck you in and to have you read more ads and things like that? Um, what can we do to help people be more connected? There's a facade of feeling connected when you're online, in yeah. the online community, but really we're less connected than, than if we're not online, if we're actually communicating with people one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Um, so what can we do to support users that way? or to support people in society. That's what I'm thinking. Well, if, if, if I also heard you reference, you know, we, you know, how can we impact kids? Um, interestingly enough, about a week ago, I helped facilitate a design workshop at one of the, the, the boys and girls clubs in San Francisco so that they could begin to look critically at the things which happen to them that they don't like, like, like bullying and how they could apply design to help figure out what to do about it. Um, so, you know, those, I mean, that was just the l primary focus of this particular workshop. But, you know, let's have more of that kind of stuff. That's great, thank you. Yeah. All right, do we have any other burning questions out there for our speaker? Left. I was thinking, to the degree that, I mean, I don't know if this is any better in a communist or socialist system either, but to the degree that a, a profit-making organization externalizes its costs through political means or lobbying means or whatever means, any means I'm sure necessary, um, maybe removing older people from its workforce is part of externalizing that cost for them. You know, they just want the hot stuff, the new stuff, <laughs> you know, the stuff that'll qu turn a quick buck and, 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 um, and, you know, let the government take care of it with Social Security. But then that, see, in a way, you know, I suggested that corporations might support some sort of design effort, but really it's what you were saying. I think the immersion of older folks with deeper thoughts and a longer perspective mixed in with the workforce, uh, all the workforces that could make some difference if the older folks were, design, I guess, A, designers, and B, sort of evangelistic about their larger humanitarian view, assuming they were humanitarian, right? Yeah. Yeah, and there are some interesting things that have been, have started in, in this kind of direction, actually. Um, and I talk about some of these kinds of things in some of the, the, the fuller ageism stuff, workshops and talks that I do. Well, uh, some, something, uh, fell, Chip Connolly, does that name ring a bell to anybody? Chip Con, is, is it Connolly? I think it's just Connolly. He, um, he's arguing that there needs to be a, a new conception of what it means to be an elder. And he argues for a dual mentorship. Usually mentorship is viewed as something you have the older mentor, you know, providing guidance to the younger mentor. He says, no, it should be dual. Have, have yes, older people with their, their wisdom, their experience, 
uh, their, their greater patience in many cases, all those things that you in theory learn uh, from, from all your experience mentoring the young, but the young mentor the old as well, so there's a partnership. And, and, and um, so, so there are things that are along those lines that are, that are being argued. He's written a book about this recently that was published just a couple of weeks ago. I went to his book launch and um, Chip Conley. Chip or Tim? Chip. Okay. Yeah, Tim Conley, wasn't he a comedian? Oh. <laughs> um, he, <laughs> then I had this idea that in a way, people who are like the conscience of corporations, the, it, it, they've kind of gotten a bad name or perception. It's almost like you want a, a gray beard, grizzled uh, Jesse Jackson shaking down Apple to, to have more minorities in it or something. So you want these gray beards to go around and shake down corporations to, you know, hire grandpa or something. I, 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 I don't, but, but partly because some of that's been done unethically, I would say, or to an extreme, that whole idea of somebody claiming to be the conscience of, of a corporation seems to have little, little buy-in. Uh, maybe I'm just talking about it in my own mind, but I think some of this is widely cultural and uh, spread. I don't know here if you have any reaction to that. Yeah, I don't know that you know uh, older folks should necessarily be turned to as 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 the sole source of the conscious of a company. Yeah. Um, I think it should be equally distributed almost. Uh, but there's 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 capability and wisdom and things learned from all that experience that can certainly contribute in critical ways uh, to that uh, uh, in, in companies. I mean, yes. I mean some. I mean, stereotypes, oh, some older people, because of the stereotypes, because of our culture, because of our society, when they reach a certain age, they start acting differently, and they start acting old, and they start thinking, oh, I'm not good enough anymore, and, and they slow down because they're supposed to slow down, because society tells them to slow down. They're rewarded for slowing down, and they check out. They throw themselves away. And that's horrific. I mean, this is a big, it's, this isn't an easy change. There's, there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, I, I wanted to uh, say how grateful I am for your many years of uh, leading this organization with grace, humor, and dedication. It's been a wonderful asset, and, uh, and, and the, particularly the way you did it. Uh, I really appreciated it. Um, and I just wanted to really thank you so much well, uh, for all that you did. Well, thank you. And thank you for heckling me. <laughs> <laughs>